Amen. What a great question. How can it be that God would love a soul like me? And we, we know, partially know the answer. You know, we can, we can mentally know the answer. It's because God is love. But then there's the actual realizing and experience of that love in salvation because Christ loved us so much as to give of himself for our sin and to pay our sin penalty. That's, that's an amazing love, and I appreciate the music this morning. Let's go to Acts chapter 3 today. We're continuing our, I didn't intend, but God has been leading in a little mini-series, I guess, in the, in the book of Acts. We began a few weeks ago with Why Church, and we looked at uh, chapter 2 and all that God did with that first church there in Jerusalem. Last week, we looked at chapter 3. Today, chapter 4. And uh, in chapter 4, we find some interesting things going on here in uh, Acts chapter 4. We began last week by talking about having opportunities and seeing the opportunities. And, and we mentioned last week how that it, with, with opportunities, especially according to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, whenever there's a great door opened, there will be adversaries. That, that's just uh, human nature. <laughs> that's how it is when there's an enemy who is in opposition to what God is doing uh, in this world. There's going to be an enemy who is an adversary that wants to resist and, and make it difficult. And this morning we're going to look at responding to adversity. How do you currently respond to adversity? And maybe ask yourself the question, where does God want to take me so I can properly respond to adversity? Let's pray. Let's ask God to Speak to our hearts today, right here from the Word of God. We're in Acts chapter 4, and may, may God instruct us as He sets the example for us. I mean, Christ did in His life about responding to adversity. There were many difficulties that He faced, many adversaries, and now the first church in Jerusalem is going through that as well, and that's a great thing for our church to understand. It's a great thing for us to understand individually as well. Let's pray. Let's ask God to teach us. Father, thank You for the example of Jesus Christ who taught us and showed us how to love your enemies. And while he was an enemy against no one, there were many who were enemies against him. And may that be true in our hearts that we are not an enemy against anyone. But when we have enemies who are against us, may we respond to adversaries, may we respond to adversity, how Christ did, how this first church did, how Peter and John did here in this chapter. Father, instruct our hearts, teach us, and we pray you'd give us this grace to respond the same way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Adversity is defined as difficulties or misfortunes. It is, it's, it's a stress. It's a trouble. It's being in, in a straight. Paul said one time, I'm in a straight betwixt two, right? I'm in this difficult position. He wanted to go home to heaven and be with the Lord, and yet he knew it was needful for him to stay on the earth. But but the word adversity is is that difficulty. We have this word adversary. An adversary is the who behind the what, all right? Sometimes we have ad adversity, which is just from circumstances, which usually are the result of people, uh, whether it be self. Well, you ever think about this? Sometimes a lot of my own adversity is from me. I, I create my own adversity because of what I did or what I didn't do. It can be on either side. But then there's plenty of times where people create adversity. They create difficulties or misfortunes. They put us in a stressful situation or a troublesome situation. I, I'm reminded of Proverbs 24, 7. It says, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. I'll tell you what, God allows adversity to show us how small our strength really is so that we then can rely upon his strength because that is of utmost importance. And I believe that when God allows adversity or allows an adversary to be at work in our lives, it's for a good cause. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. And so God, God takes adversity. God will allow adversaries to be at work in our lives because God has a good work to do in us and through us as a result of that. And so we don't need to be afraid of adversities. In fact, we don't need to be afraid of the adversary or adversaries because God is greater. Our Father is greater. Greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world. I don't have to be fearful. I just need to be focused on the Lord Jesus and I need to be trusting in Him and obeying Him. 
In fact, it says over here in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse uh, 6, it says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, testings, uh, difficulties. God's teaching us here that we may go through periods of time. There may be a season of time in which we're in heaviness because of many temptations. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. You know, you know what God finds absolutely precious in our lives is when we exhibit faith. The, the, the most amazing thing and the most important, well, I don't think I can say important. It's real close. Top three, right? What does God want from us? He wants us to have faith. What is faith? Confidence in Him. Confidence in His character. Confidence in His word. Confidence in His ability to intervene and do what only He can do. And so God allows temptations. He allows adversity. He allows adversaries in our lives that we would learn faith because it's more precious to him than of gold that perisheth. And so God, God wants us to have these times of adversity to teach us how good he is. And when we respond right to adversity, when we respond right to an adversary, God's going to accomplish that. Now we can respond wrong. We can, we can when adversity comes, we go hide somewhere. We can just shy away from adversity. We can run from the adversary. There are so many other options that we could have, but God would have us to get focused on Him. We're in chapter 4. In chapter 3, in fulfilling the commandment of chapter 1, in verse 8, to get the gospel into all the world, in chapter 3, Peter and John, they go out there, they're on the way to the, the, to the temple to pray at the ninth hour, and they meet that impotent man, and they, they, they heal him, he's able to walk, and it wasn't them that healed him, it was the Lord, but they're the ones that gave the message, they re the man responded by faith, he was restored in his, in his legs and his feet, and he was leaping up and, and rejoicing. And then Peter not only had that opportunity, but then the whole crowd gathers and then he preaches to them as well because he saw the opportunity to preach and, and to invest in people's lives. And that's so important that, that we see these opportunities. And then we get to chapter 4. Chapter 4 is changes. You see, in chapter, in chapter 3, they're just obeying. And you say, well, good for them that they obeyed. But there's an adversary or adversaries that are not going to like your obedience. When you, when you fulfill God's commands, you say, well, all I'm doing, in, 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 if you think about this, all that we're doing in, in obeying God is loving God and loving people. All, all of God's commands boil down to loving God and loving God's people, lo loving the people of this world. And you may be surprised, but there are going to be people who are against you because of that. They will be an adversary against you because of such things. And, and it's, it's, it's challenging at times, but we've got to learn to focus on the Lord. Obey God. In chapter 3, they're obeying. They see the opportunities, they capitalize, and they do what they're supposed to do by proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. But then in chapter 4 comes the adversary. And so here we look, look at verse one with me in chapter four. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. So they're, they're, they're speaking unto the people back in chapter three. But then here comes the priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees. They come upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You say, well, why are they grieved about that? What, what's going on? Why, why would they be so, so bothered in their hearts? Well, religious people oftentimes are bothered by truth. Because when Peter and John are simply preaching the truth of who Jesus is, they're not trying to create a, a following of themselves, whereas in religion they do. They're simply trying to promote Jesus Christ and who he is, giving people the message of love, the message of hope, the message of salvation. But there, there were people then who are opposing that because that's upsetting their, their system, their religious system. 
And so all that Peter was doing was preaching Christ. Verse 3, and they laid hands on them and put them in hold. They're arrested, right? They're put in prison until the next day. Overnight, they're in prison, for it was now eventide. It was the evening time, and, and it was time. You know, they went up to prayer about 3 p.m., and so three hours have elapsed between chapter 3 and chapter 4, and uh, they're in prison. But watch verse 4, how be it many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Can, can, you, can you imagine that? <laughs> I can't. I can't imagine what it was like. I mean, God was greatly using Peter's life. This is the same Peter that had denied the Lord three times back in the Gospels. The same Peter who was so self-focused in, in a lot of ways and so dependent upon self. This same Peter who really got changed by the Lord in, in many ways through that, it now in the book of Acts is like a different man. And in Acts chapter 2, he preaches, he just simply preaches, 3,000 get saved. In chapter 4, we realize 5,000 men get saved, almost implying maybe there are women and others, uh, young, young adults that, that got saved as well. And this is just an, an amazing event that's taking place here. I mean, this, this, it's, a, it's a mega church now, right? I mean, it's just huge. But don't worry, God has a plan for that mega church to be a mother church and start churches all over the world. And that's exactly what happens as Acts unfolds. And by the way, that ought to be a desire for every church today, not to be a mega church, to be a mother church, to be a church that starts more and gets the word out there because it's not about us. It's about the Lord. It's about them getting the gospel to this lost world. That ought to be our desire. But here they are. They're now in a difficult situation. And let's, let's mark how they respond to this adversity, to this difficulty, this stress. I've, I've never, and I, I, I hope I never have to, spend a night in jail. I never have so far. And if I do, I hope it's for a righteous reason, amen? I hope it's because of, well, I don't hope it happens. But if it does, may it be because I was preaching the name of Jesus Christ. Because I was taking a stand for the cause of Christ. In our time in, in Eswatini, I had wondered over there, we were there for five years, and I wondered what would happen if I was ever in prison for uh, preaching the truth. And, and while that's not a, a concern over there at this time, like it's not a concern here at this time, I was just very fearful because the prisons here are nice. Prisons, pris, prisons in, I've been inside prisons in America as, as, a, as, a, as a chaplain, as a pastor, uh, and, you know, they're not bad. But I would not want to be in a prison over there. I, I tell you what, that, would, that, kind, of, that kind of is fearful. <laughs> Whereas here, it'd be like, well, that wouldn't be, not, wouldn't, be, wouldn't be great, but it wouldn't be that bad either, comparatively speaking. But what would you do? Honestly, let's, let's, let's be forward thinking. What if one day in our nation it is illegal to own this book of what they've been trying to call hate speech? What would you do? Would you get rid of it? Would you hold on to it? Would you hold on to the, I mean, what if, it, what if it was illegal one day to speak in the name of Jesus Christ? Because that's, that would be um, not, non-inclusive. I mean, what, what, I mean, have you been thinking about that? I'm not going looking for this stuff. This stuff comes to me. And, and, and what, what, what's, what would you do? If you were in that adversity, if you were in that situation, and what if you were arrested? What if you were imprisoned? How would you respond? Well, let's, let's, let's read this. Let's see what's going on here in Acts 4 and see how they responded. Verse 5, And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Now, I'm going to stop right there. If you're following Peter's pattern from chapter 2 to chapter 3 to chapter 4, do you think Peter's going to just say nothing? Do you think Peter, Peter who, who used to be so self-contained uh, and, and, and self-regulated by what he wants? and his, No, no, he's ready. He is ready. He's not going to deny the Lord this time. 
He has set a pattern. He has learned the hard way that denying the Lord is not the right answer. It's not a good answer. There's a personal testimony we just learned about of, of, of not only um, living for the Lord internally, but letting it come out into public, not trying to be uh, pushy or, or obnoxious, but all I realize in, in my Christian life is I'm just going to live for Christ. And just having a desire to live for Christ, it, it manifests itself. I don't wake up in the morning thinking to myself, hmm, I better be a good testimony today. I, I, I don't wake up thinking about that. Now, I, I know that's a desire of mine. I want to be a good testimony. But if my focus is to simply live for Christ, then it automatically will be. It will be a good testimony if my focus and walk is after the Lord Jesus. And so Peter has set this new personal testimony that he, was, he is committed to Christ. He will proclaim his name. He will not deny his name. And in chapter 2, in chapter 3, and again in chapter 4, by what power or by what name have you done this? Verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I think that's probably the key even in Peter's life, before and after, the difference, the difference is being filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. Peter, Peter just, he, he, he sees this opportunity. And so here's, here's the first thing I see in responding to adversity. Proclaiming God's son should always be what we do in adverse scenarios. When facing an adversary, be, be quick, proclaim God's son. You say, well, you're talking about even adversity in regular? Yeah. Shouldn't every opportunity we have, every, everything we seek, should not that be a way in which we can communicate to people who Jesus Christ is? Not only in stating it, but in showing it. We can state it. Thanks for the notes, brother. We can state it and we can show it. I just learned that in the last hour. And so, you know, here we will put it to practice. But in, in, an, in an adverse scenario, in adversity, I ought to be able to state who Jesus is and show who Jesus is by responding to adversity like Jesus did. And I get to proclaim him in word and in action, in attitude, in my response to adversity. Peter, Peter, he sees this adverse scenario. He just spent the night in prison. Now he's being brought before the Jewish council, and they've got a question for him. By what power, by what name have ye done this? And Peter is ready to proclaim who Jesus is. And he lets them, lets them have it, so to speak, right? He says, be it known unto you all, there in verse 10, to all the people of Israel. And, and, and know this, there's still a lot of people spending time in Jerusalem still. I just... I Googled it yesterday. They anticipate or they, they kind of look back and from educated guesswork, I guess, and whatever records they have, the population of Jerusalem about the time of Christ, about 20,000 people. So not a, not a large community by our estimations in today's standards, but that's just the normal population. Imagine the tens of thousands of more that were there from all around the world for Passover, for Pentecost, and they're still, they're still in the area. I mean, obviously, with 3,000 getting saved in Acts 2 and now 5,000 men in Acts chapter 4, there, there are thousands, tens of thousands of people in the area. And, and Peter wants not only those that are right there in Jerusalem, but all of Israel to know that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised up from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole giving all the glory, proclaiming who Jesus is to these people. And I think that ought to be high in our minds. If we face adversity now and we face adversity in the future, we ought to look at these as opportunities to proclaim verbally and in action who Jesus is. It's a great opportunity. 
But that's got to be our mindset. That's got to be a pattern. Lest we find ourselves like Peter back in the Gospels when he denies the Lord three times. When Peter in adverse scenarios is quick to grab the sword and cut off the guy Malchus's ear. And, and he, he's quick to do this and in his own strength. But now we see him quick to proclaim God's son. I like verse 11. He goes on to say, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. You, you rejected him. You thought, you thought that stone was unworthy. And so he was rejected by you. You had him crucified. And in, and in, and in picture, he's saying he's the headstone of the corner. He's the head of the corner. By the way, fulfilling Psalm 118, as we were just learning the other night, it fulfills that prophecy in Psalm 118. Peter in fact, look over here. This is interesting to me. In 1 Peter chapter 2, notice who's using this language. It's Peter. Peter understands who Jesus is. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And so depending on how we respond to Christ is how we see him. If, we're, if we want our sin, if we are wanting to be disobedient in life and pursue after self and sin, we're, people will reject Jesus Christ. They won't be precious to him. But to those who believe upon Jesus, he is precious and he is the head of the corner. And a cornerstone, a cornerstone was the most important stone when building back in the day with, with, with the stone material. And it would, had to be perfectly square. All six sides had to be perfectly square because the walls are going to line up with that cornerstone. And it set the foundation level too. Everything was all about and lined up with the cornerstone. And Jesus Christ pictures that. He is perfect. He is exact. He is precious. He is the chief cornerstone. And Peter brings it out to them. You're rejecting him, but he's most precious. He is perfect. That's why he says in verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. There, there's no other way of salvation, but through Jesus Christ, He is the only way, and we must be saved. There's that imperative, we must be saved, because without Christ, we are lost. We will be judged in hell, but with Christ, we can be set free from the penalty of that sin and also the presence and power of sin as well. And Peter, he is quick to proclaim this. He knows, Peter knows, like we ought to know too, that the word of God is powerful. And we ought to proclaim the word of God. Verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus and beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And here's Peter they, they, and John. They're they're boldly proclaiming. They know Isaiah 55. These men know Isaiah 55. How God's word will not return void. Paul knew that as well. And, and Paul said that even he when he was in prison, Paul said, "But the word of God is not bound." And and, and child of God, let me encourage you with this. In verse scenarios when facing adversaries be quick and ready to give the word of God about the son of God because God's word will not return void and then there's this living example standing next to them this impotent man that everybody knew everybody know he's been he's been lame from his mother's womb is now standing there with him perfectly whole Nobody, nobody, even the religious crowd, cannot deny that a huge miracle has taken place. And the, and the noise of this is spreading everywhere. And that's why the religious crowd is trying to do some damage control. Oh, no, we may lose followers. But you see, Peter doesn't focus on followers. 
He just wants to be a follower of Christ and get others to look to Christ as well. This man became a living testimony. They're beholding the man which was healed standing with them. And they, they could say nothing against it. Reminds me of salvation today. You want, you want to back up? You want to give living proof of the, the effectiveness of the word of God and what Jesus has done for us? When people get saved, they're standing there as living proof of a change of heart and life in, in a greater way than the impotent man. He was only here for them to see in, in a physical sense. I think he got saved as well. And time would then also show, at this point, they can't see his salvation. They can see his physical healing. They can't see his spiritual healing. But in time, those that knew him before and those that know him afterwards are going to be able to see, man, not only is his physical body different, but his heart is different. And that's what's true of salvation today. It shows the power of God because there's a changed heart. And so in adversity, number one, always be ready to proclaim God's son. Number two prioritizing God's authority. Look at verse 15. But when they had commanded them to go outside, out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them, because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Here we see prioritizing God's authority. When you face adversity and when people, when man, when society is giving you these adverse conditions, when, when the world becomes your adversary, when even if it's uh, less different than that, if it's, if it's Satan himself being an adversary unto you, have to have this right mindset as we see in this example of prioritizing God's authority. What if there comes a day, again, as we saw with, uh, with Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we saw them in Daniel chapter number three facing that exact scenario. And I'm wondering if Peter and John were like, hey, hey, guy, hey, you know, maybe, maybe Peter's like to John, hey, John, remember what, what, the, what Shadrach, Meshach, yeah, you remember what they did? Let's do the same. They're, those three men are just the same example to us as it was to, to the Peter and John. They had the scriptures. And they know what God did for those three men who trusted in him. And we're going to do the same. We're going to prioritize God's authority. Man, even if they, you know, it, where for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was the entire known world under Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the known world. The Babylon Empire was huge. And he made this rule, had this thing set. But they would not obey man's laws if it opposed God's law. And I think that's a great mindset to have. I, you know, the Bible teaches us in Romans, especially Romans chapter 13, that we ought to obey civil law. I'm, I am for law and law enforcement. That's a good thing. The only time I take exception is if man's laws require me to go against God's laws. Then I have a higher authority than man. I have a higher authority than civil government. It's God himself, the creator, the ultimate authority, the author of this world and this universe of life the author himself has the ultimate authority, and I defer to his authority. That is the higher authority that we ought to go to. We have these threatenings of men. They threatened them many times. They commanded them. They threatened them not to speak about this Jesus anymore. Don't, we don't want this spreading anymore. We're going to lose our following. You can't say anymore. They, they called them in there in verse 18. They commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. 
You stop. You stop teaching this name of Jesus. You, you stop uh, doing these things. Don't speak to any man about this name anymore. They command them. But I love the response there. Peter says in verse 18, verse 19, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God, judge ye. He's, he's getting them to think. Uh, men, uh, I, I appreciate you. I mean, I'm paraphrasing you, right? I'm putting words in their mouth. I appreciate you. I respect your authority. But we have a command from God to be a witness back in Acts 1.8 unto the name of Jesus. We're to be witnesses of who he is. We're to be witnesses of what he's done in our lives. And you want us to be quiet? Well, you, you make a decision. You judge. You judge whether we should obey God or not. Because we have a high authority and we are going to obey God. And I love what he says there in verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. How, how can, I mean, imagine you being a, a, a one of the apostles and having gone through, you, you've been with Jesus for three and a half years. You, you've, you've been down and you've seen all these things and, and you've gone through your own growth. I mean, Peter had a lot of growth. He had to grow in the Lord. And then they find the empty tomb. And then the day of Pentecost happens and they're, they're filled with the Spirit of God. And, 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 and now they go through, I mean, Peter, how, how can he be quiet? You know, when, when, when things really affect our body, and it ought to be the same today. If, if our lives, if our hearts have truly been impacted by the Lord Jesus Christ, how can we not but speak of those things? Has God done something for you recently? Tell some about it. Let people know. We can, we can joyfully be witnesses of who Jesus is, what he has done. But we've got we've to prioritize God's authority. I wonder, I wonder how many, and, and I, I've not been in this situation yet. I think the day's coming myself. I'm not a prophet. I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. I just see what Revelation talks about, Matthew 24. I mean, there's just, I, I think the day's coming when it's not going to be favorable for us to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Jesus said in the end times that men will hate you because of my name's sake. And um, I don't know if there will be a law against it. Wouldn't surprise me. You look back at that global system back there in Daniel's day. There could be a global system coming that also makes a law that prohibits that, worshiping anything but their little G-God. How would you respond to that? What would you do? Well, you know, we just want to be peacemakers, and so uh, I guess we'll change gods. Who's your authority? We have a higher authority. Well, they further threaten them there in verse 21. Now we see the last thing here in verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company. Who's that? That's their church. They went to be with the brethren, right? And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted, who's at the church? They lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David had said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. So in, in adversity, we see Peter and John, they proclaim God's son. They prioritize God's authority. 
And then they pray for God's grace. And I, I think this is a, just an amazing way that this chapter uh, concludes in the sense that they've been threatened. They're, they're now in adverse conditions, okay? This has never happened before. This is the first time witnesses of Jesus Christ, Christians, are being threatened to remain silent. You don't speak anymore in this name of Jesus. You be quiet. You say nothing. You just, you just do what we say and everything will be okay. Wait a minute. Who's the higher authority? It's not going to be okay for us if we don't obey God. We've got to obey. That's the most important thing. Obeying God is the most important. It's more important than obeying man. And again, I'm all for obeying civil government, but if they tell me I can't obey God, I have to obey God. It's a higher priority, a higher authority. And so that for the very first time, we've got a situation. We are in adverse circumstances. What are we going to do? Let's go to our church. Let's tell them what happened. And the church says, let's pray. What, what, a, what, a, great, what a great response. Let's pray about this. Let's take this before God's throne. He is the highest authority. They tell their church, they rehearse what man has said, but they took it. Look what they say there. And they begin to pray in verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God. You're the ruler. You're in charge. You have made the heavens and the earth. You made the sea and all the creatures of the sea, all the creatures of the, everything. You've made everything. God, you're, 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 the, you're God. It's okay. We know this. And we've got to have our hearts and minds secured by that reality. God is God. It even fulfills Psalm 2, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? By the way, do you notice that wording there in verse 25? It teaches inspiration. It says, God, back in verse 24, who by the mouth of David, uh, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said. Who's speaking in Psalm 2? It's God through the mouth of David. God, God is saying this to us. And he's saying to the world, why, why did the heathen rage? Why do people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth, read, read Psalm 2 later, you'll see how the, the kings of the earth gather themselves together against God and against his anointed. Well, here's, here in, in Acts is, is the, the beginning of that being fulfilled. They're against him. And I believe there's a future fulfillment of this as well. And when Christ comes back the second time is when I believe this thing is really being fulfilled. As all the kings of the earth gather together, and all the armies of the world gather together against Jerusalem. That, that's when Christ returns. The battle of Armageddon will take place. But they, they take this before the Lord. Reminds me of King Hezekiah. Back in the book of Isaiah, when the, when the king of Assyria, when they wrote a letter to the king of Israel to say, you better, you better surrender. Your God can't help you. You know, you know Hezekiah responded? He took that letter and he spread it out there before the Lord. Lord, behold, behold their threatenings. You can go read Isaiah and, and see that. And I just, I've, always, I've always thought about that, how Isaiah just, he just took this, this adverse letter and just spread it out before the Lord. Lord, here's, here's what they're saying. You're God. I'm looking to you. But is that, is that a great way to respond to adversity, to adversity? Pray about it. Remember, I'm to love my enemy. I'm to pray for them that despitefully use me. Pray about it. It's God's will for the adversary, these adversaries, to get saved. It's God's will that in adversity to grow me up in faith. How to pray about it. God, God, what, what do you want me to do? How am I to handle this? So the church says, Lord, what, what do we do here? He says in verse 29, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants. Watch what they ask for that with all boldness they may speak thy word. They're not asking God to take away the government and these, this council. They're not asking God uh, to have the law rewritten. They're just asking God to give them boldness to obey what God already told them to do. And I, I just, that's just, oh, wow. 
What an example. So how why I do that? I, I don't <laughs> I just know that if I'm faithful to what I face now and I learn to pray and take it before God, knowing He's the highest authority, if I learn now in whatever adversity I face now, and in time, as time goes on, I, I hope the pattern remains the same. The tests get harder, but the answer is always the same, right? Wouldn't that be a great way to go through school? You take you're taking a different test, but the answer is always the same. The test gets harder, but the answer is always the same. That's how it is in faith. We're all, it's always the same answer. Trust and obey. Just the tests get harder. You go from first grade to twelfth grade, the tests get harder. The answer's always the same. And they say, hey, this is not even a question. We're not careful to answer thee, as they said in Daniel. We're not careful to answer thee. We have to obey God. We want to obey God. How can we not but speak about Jesus Christ? Who he is, what he's done. Here's the example. Here's this impotent man. Look, look what God can do. We, we have to talk. We have to speak. We have to proclaim who Jesus is. And so they just wanted boldness. Why? Because they knew they got the threats. They knew that they're going into uncharted waters as Christians. You see, this, this adversity is going to become persecution. As the chapters go forward, it starts with this light threatening, but it's going to get worse to the point of death, martyrdom, being persecuted. It, it, it works its way up. But let's respond right when it's little. Let's respond the right way. Watch verse 31 and we'll close. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. God heard their prayer. God was in the midst of them. And God gave them boldness to do what God already commanded them to do. Why? The whole world needs to hear about Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul said that in Ephesians 6. He says in verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Even Paul there and also in Philippians, he's one of boldness. Boldness to do what God already commanded him to do. How, how do we respond to adversity? Let's, let's proclaim God's Son. Let's prioritize God's authority and let's pray for God's grace to simply what's what's grace divine enabling to simply do what he's already commanded us to do father thank you for the example of Peter and John father if you can do this in Peter's life certainly you can do it in our lives as well that we would be bold to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ father help us to always respond right to adversity, to adversaries. May we have it in our hearts to proclaim God's Son in, both in word and in deed. May we always look to you because you're the highest authority. May we submit to your authority and follow after you. And Father, may we learn to pray because you will intervene. Bless our response, we pray in Jesus' name.